Thanks, Mary. It's exciting to be here with, uh, with uh, so many interested people. So we're going to just talk about the uh, um, lumbar disc replacement as kind of being the real deal, even though uh, a lot of people would argue. But I'm going to show you the best uh, scientific evidence that we've ever been able to assemble um, as clinicians. And that includes any of the implants that are so used in the body all the time. Um, uh, better, whoops, uh, there's better literature for disc replacement than uh, hips and knees, better than intraocular lenses, plates, screws, you know, things that are put in uh, in, in uh, multiples of what we do for uh, a spinal arthroplasty. But just like our uh, dear departed friend, um, Rodney Dangerfield, uh, arthroplasty gets no respect um, in a lot of areas, even cervical still it regionally doesn't get the respect, but certainly lumbar, I think, is uh, disrespected. And um, as uh, was alluded to in Armin's uh, lecture on the cervical, certainly when we started talking about lumbar disc replacement, we started to present our very earliest uh, results of the trials. The, these are the things that people um, uh, accused uh, us of doing, of, of stretching indications. And this was a concern that we'd be operating on far more people than we're currently getting fusions. Um, we would get poor outcomes because we would uh, be less selective in choosing our patients. Um, as a result of this uh, and a result of the direct anterior approach that was required for arthroplasty, that there would be higher perioperative complications. And then as these discs would certainly fail because they were new, uh, that there would be uh, more revisions uh, with a significant uh, morbidity and even mortalities. And people even said to us, you, you know, you'll be killing patients with this technology. Um, so the first pro disc was um, implanted actually 19 years ago today. Today is an anniversary. And this is the uh, picture showing the first pro disc. And uh, that's Terry Marnay, who, who's the inventor, who's a French uh, uh, spine surgeon who flew over and did the first few cases with us. So this is uh, actually right to the day, um, historic anniversary. And this was just three weeks after 9-11, if you can imagine how all awkward that was to start a, a, a multinational study. But um, at Texas Back Institute, um, now Scott had started the Charité study the year before, and we were very interested in uh, motion devices. So you can see here the, the number of um, uh, devices that we have implanted. And early in 2000, 2001, it was really just the very beginnings of uh, enrollment and recruitment for the studies. But over the years, um, through 2005, when we were recruiting for both one and two level PRODISC studies, and then in 2006, the Charité was approved and the ProDisc was approved in 2007. It started to run into insurance pushback. So those, that's where those numbers have fallen, whereas the cervical disc replacement uh, IDE started and you can see the growth uh, over the years. But we are really heavily committed to using this technology and think it's the right thing for patients and now have a very long-term follow-up with 19 and 20 year follow-up in our, our practice. Uh, but just a historic note is that uh, spinal surgery, even fusion for degenerative disc disease before year 2000, uh, was not well thought of. There was not a lot of strong level one data. And at one point, I did a literature review decade by decade. And in the entire decade of the 70s, there were only six articles that talked about doing uh, surgery, fusion surgery for degenerative disc disease. In the 80s, only 50 articles. And in the entire decade of the 90s, there were only 200 articles. And a lot of the um, uh, more prominent uh, surgeons at the time, including most of the chairmen who trained the senior faculty around today, did not feel there was a value to doing fusions for back pain. And the reason is that a lot of these studies were a mixed bag, that in that fusion population, there was an 80-year-old with degenerative scoliosis, a 45-year-old with degenerative spondy and stenosis, and a 20 year old with a, a grade three lytic spondy. And they were all considered as fusions for a back pain. And obviously there are gonna be uh, a lot of other variables that will, will give you a blended and generally not superb uh, outcome. So this all changed in year 2000 because lumbar artificial discs were considered um, class three devices or novel technology by the FDA they insisted that uh, multi-center prospective randomized studies uh, be done comparing it to something that uh, was already FDA approved by other uh, mechanisms, which was fusion. So for the first time, we started to do prospective studies, not just a retrospective analysis 
of a single doctor or a single center or even multiple centers, but these were prospective studies selecting the patients beforehand with very uh, strict criteria. Um, these patients had to fit in a box. They had to be 18 to 60. They had to have failed at least six months of conservative care. They had minimum uh, ODI requirements, minimum BAS requirements. Otherwise, they were not included in the study. Um, and they were randomized. So once the patient met all criteria, they were externally randomized, generally two to one. So now we have these large groups of patients in multiple centers who all met the same criteria, two out of three getting randomly assigned to get an artificial disc, one out of three to a fusion. And now we've got to follow these people for two years uh, and beyond in order to satisfy FDA requirements. So it's sort of, it's it forced science upon clinicians. And, um, you know, we were is grudgingly at first, but sort of uh, uh, admiringly at, uh, towards the end at how we were made to get good data. So this, this really good quality level one data was collected both on the fusion patients as well as the arthroplasty patients. So finally, we were uh, planting the seeds in a garden of good science, and one day we would, we would uh, be able to reap the benefits. And um, the outcomes of lumbar arthroplasty really exceeded our expectations, and uh, we have lots of layers of good data to show that. Uh, this is just a graph showing arthroplasty publications. And as I said, be before the year 2000, very little had been published. It was just a smattering of European reports about arthroplasty. Uh, but as of 2000, 2001, we started to build a database of uh, peer-reviewed published um, uh, papers on both lumbar and cervical arthroplasty. And these serve as the basis for the, the, the data that we can rely on now when we advise patients. There's been five-year follow-up of the prospective randomized study on the Charité that was reported by Rick Geyer, five-year follow-up of um, the Prodis patients uh, using uh, the, the complete cohorts in every single one of the investigational sites, high follow-up rate showing that there was no loss of uh, improvement from the two-year data that was uh, supplied to the FDA for approval and the 60-month follow-up. Uh, even the two year, the two level, I'm sorry, the two level uh, uh, protus uh, lumbar disc replacement study reported five year reoperation rates just recently by Chris Radcliffe. And then the active L, the last of the uh, lumbar disc replacements to be FDA approved, uh, recently published their five year results. And this was a disc versus disc trial, not a disc versus fusion. Uh, because the controls were both ProDisc and Charité, which had already um, received their FDA approval at the beginning of this trial. So here we see long-term data for three different discs showing significant improvements from preoperative rates of both uh, ODI, SOSB Disability Index, and VAS on patients who had failed a minimum of six months of conservative care. So patients were stalled at these rates uh, despite uh, very aggressive conservative care. And the big differentiator for them was um, implantation of an artificial disc. And you can see the improvement at two years, three years, four years, and five years. What we don't see is an uptick. We don't see these patients getting worse over time, but they maintain their improvement. Uh, we've even looked at uh, some of the seven-year follow-up for the active L patient population. And this paper is uh, actually in submission. Patients, again, maintain that improvement for the additional two years to seven years. Uh, one of the striking features is that opioid use is essentially 0% um, at seven years after receiving a disc replacement, uh, regardless of the amount of opioid use uh, preoperatively. And again, a pretty high follow-up rate for a seven-year study. There's so much data that's accumulated. Um, in each of these uh, prospective randomized multicenter trials is a level 1B data. It's really high-level data. But because we have so much of it, we're able to actually elevate it to level 1A, which is a meta-analysis of this prospectively uh, collected data. And we were able to do that uh, and publish it uh, just a couple of years ago in the Global Spine Journal. And this allows you to pool the raw data and then subject it to, to even more stringent statistical analysis. You can uh, find risk ratios and here we had uh, three IDE studies and one OUS study. This is a Scandinavian study that used several different disc replacements versus several different types of fusion, but it was a prospective randomized study with data collected for five years. So it met the PRISM criteria for inclusion in a, a meta-analysis. 
So it is one of the, the four papers that uh, uh, was fit for analysis. And here you can see that the risk ratio of an improvement in ODI success at the end of five years favors arthroplasty um, over uh, fusions, uh, that the risk ratio for lowering your VAS back pain is significantly in favor of arthroplasty over fusion. If we look at the reoperation rate, your risk of a reoperation rate at five years in all of this uh, pool data is almost 50%. It's almost one half of what it would be if you were in a fusion cohort. And lastly, uh, patient willingness to have that surgery again is significantly more in the arthroplasty group than in the fusion group. And again, this is an international group of patients um, uh, with very careful data collection over five years. Um, at Texas Back, we reached out to about 75 of our patients because we, we wanted to get a 10-year data point, just an idea of a 10-year data point. And um, here they are. Here are the data points for both our fusion and produce patients uh, for VAS and ODI. And you can see they are in line with the, the fairly stable findings we saw um, at uh, uh, two years and five years. So again, give it, giving us uh, encouragement that this is a good technology, it's a good thing for our patients, and it has some durability. The, the holy grail of arthroplasty was, would it protect the adjacent levels better than a fusion did? And we were able to use the data that was uh, collected in, these, in the study, particularly this was the Protus study, in order to help um, e evaluate that, that question. So what we did is uh, all the x-rays were digitized at every single visit and they were down in the medical metrics database. So we asked the radiologist there to look at the level above where we were going to intervene on a pre-op film, fast forward to the five-year film and score those two uh, adjacent level discs. And there's a validated scoring system that gives points for um, disc height loss, end plate sclerosis, osteophytes and translation. And they scored those discs. And here's what they found. We asked them, what is the worsening, what percent of patients worsened in those who randomized to fusions? And they said it was 28.6% of the patients who randomized to a fusion uh, were worse at five years at the level above. Well, how about the patients who randomized to an artificial disc? Otherwise, everything else was the same. They found worsening in only 9.2%. And that difference is more than three to one. It is highly statistically significant. So he said, you know what, let's, let's peel the, the onion one more layer because there's a bunch of patients in there who had purely single level disease. They had pristine adjacent levels. So those patients on their pre-op film, you would have scored as a zero. They had none of those four findings. Can you pick out those patients, fast forward to their five-year films, and tell us what percent of those have developed adjacent level changes or worsening from zero. And they said, sure. So of the patients who randomized to a fusion, 23.8% of them now had findings of decreased height, sclerosis, osteophytes, or translation. Those findings were only in 6.7% of the patients who just randomly were assigned to receive an artificial disc. So that difference is also greater than three to one um, and even more highly statistically significant. So uh, this was the first time we really had really good science around that question of can arthroplasty protect the adjacent level. Using data from the active L prospective randomized trial, we were able to actually get even more granularity. And we asked them to do the same thing, to measure the difference, but now uh, pitted against the segmental motion because they have an algorithm to also measure how much motion we were able to put into that patient with an artificial disc. And as you can see here, the percentage of patients who develop adjacent level degeneration decreases proportional to how many degrees of motion we're able to maintain at five years in that segment. So much so that if we can give them greater than five to six degrees of motion, there's essentially zero worsening of adjacent segment disease at the level above a disc replacement. So we're really getting our arms around um, some really good information now for um, uh, recommending disc replacement to our patients. Revision rates, um, and it's the anterior revision rate that we were so concerned about. Well, one easy way to do that was to look at the first artificial disc that was implanted in uh, 2000 by Scott Blumenthal, and we followed the next 1,700 patients over the next 17 years 
and the number of patients who required an anterior revision was 17. So that is a 1% anterior revision rate, which fits with two other large series looking at anterior revision rates and arthroplasty patients also being about 1%. So here are the things, that, again, that, that people threw arrows or shot arrows at us for, stretched indications, poor outcomes, higher perioperative complications, and more significant revisions. And now looking back 19 years to the day from the, the first one of the protests we put in and 20 years from the first Charité, we can say that that is not a concern. So what's in the future? I think there'll be better diagnostic tools for us, better implants, better designs maybe better applications, maybe at the ends of uh, long deformity constructs, maybe some designs that'll be more protective to SI joints, maybe there'll be level specific designs. These are things that the young guys listening in um, can look to their future and help us answer those questions. Arthroplasty in the high demand patient, as Todd showed, uh, very athletic people or professional athletes um, or the military where there's good funding for it. So just, just remember now when you know, Rodney Dangerfield is uh, kind of wiping his forehead that we have the highest level data uh, that you can possibly generate. And this is uh, artwork by Terry Marnay, um, kind of showing that we're in a continuum of learning. You know, this is the, uh, the image of us doing this first uh, protest, but it's superimposed on, on Rembrandt's anatomy lesson. And there's another layer of you guys in the future um, ahead of us. So. Uh, thank you very much again for uh, letting uh, uh, Jens and the Seattle Science people put this together and let me participate. Uh, thank you. Jens, uh, I think we're, we're going to try to get close to being back on track. Yes, uh, and um, I'm just going to announce that um, I'm probably going to not do my lecture on the laminotomies because there's Professor Hofstetter here who's going to talk about that somewhat, if that's okay with you. And we'll cover that in the lab. And if there were to be time later, I'm happy to add that on. Uh, so um, a couple of questions. So one, in our state of Washington, a, a state regulatory body decided to not uh, allow lumbar disc replacements anymore after having had it in place for 10 years with a perfect safety record. Now you've addressed outcomes, you've uh, uh, addressed reoperation rates, you've addressed adjacent segment disease, all very convincingly. They rejected, the panel rejected lumbar disc replacements because of safety concerns. And the study that they quoted is from Norway, where they did not have access surgeons and they did multi-level disc replacements. And there were, I think, one fatality, if I remember it right, and uh, one or two patients with major vascular injuries. So please address the North American experience on patient safety with lumbar disc replacements. Thank you. I think Jack froze. <laughs> that's, that's not good timing. Todd. Can you unfreeze him? Can you address your perspective? You've obviously been very, very a keen follower of the literature. What has the safety uh, aspect of lumbar disc replacements been in your perspective? Um, I have uh, personally done, I don't know, several hundred uh, three-level lumbars. I personally have a three-level lumbar and a fusion at uh, L45 and a three-level artificial uh, protus above. Um, I think between the several hundred, in fact, just Tuesday, I did a, a, a four level, a three level arthroplasty lumbar and a, a fusion at five one because of a steep slope angle. In my experience, we always use a vascular surgeon. So we're lucky we have a really great access surgeon who just does this all day. So every day he's jumping room to room between Johnson, Landman, and he's just going around as we do the approaches. So he's so skilled. He's done over 5,500 anterior lumbar approaches. We don't have vascular injuries at all with him or his partner. Um, so uh, that part of it, um, uh, Jack test texted me and said his internet went out again. So he's gonna try to reboot. But uh, we have not seen that. And, and with, with really skilled vascular surgeons and, and our vascular surgeon actually will, uh, if, if you, you have surgeons you wanna have trained, they can send them down and be trained uh, with our vascular surgeons. It's, uh, it's quite amazing. I know Matt Gornett does his own exposures. I don't know what he's doing out there in St. Louis, but uh, in Los Angeles, in California, you, you, you don't want that liability issue and you don't want and the complication risks. If you tear a vessel, you need to know how to repair it properly. So um, really haven't seen it, haven't had any deaths. Sure, have, have had some tears and veins, of course. Um, 
our, our Dr. Wagner, our vascular surgeon, comes in and repairs it in literally five minutes, and off we go, and we finish the case. So um, not been an issue. I, honestly, Jens, I've not seen that. I've had no deaths. I, I know your work, and it's phenomenal. One follow-up question quickly, and then we'll have to go into the lab. And I don't know whether the jack is unfrozen yet. But, Todd, have you ever had a situation where you had to abandon a disc replacement and substitute it for a fusion due to access uh, limitations, i.e. in the 4 or 5 corridor? Yes, I have. Uh, usually those are patients who have had some prior surgery retroperitoneally. We're usually prepared for that because the vascular surgeon has so much experience. And sometimes if patients have had, for example, let's say a T-lift at L5S1, and they may have a lot of anterior uh, retroperitoneal inflammation, and then the, the veins may be stuck. So for example, if they've had a prior T-lift at 5.1 and we're going to 4.5, we do advise the patient, hey, there's a chance that if we can't mobilize your common iliac, over far enough. And if Dr. Wagner can't do it, nobody can. And that, that's what happened to me, actually, is I had my three artificials and then my L4-5. He said, there's no way I'm going to even try to move your vein. So I was an uh, X-lift and perk screwed at five at 4-5. My 5-1, I don't know why it's normal. But yes, I've had to do that a couple times. Now that you disclosed your personal health information with the greater public, and by the way, we have now over 90 participants, I, uh, I want to give you a challenge that you're welcome to say no to. If you're willing to show your images later, we'd love to see that, obviously. But feel free to say no. Oh, absolutely. Presentation. <laughs> you're awesome. Oh, good. I'm happy to.